In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. No doubt many of us are here gathered today because not only does this happen to be the Saturday before Christmas, the Saturday before Nativity, but it just happens to be Christmas Eve this year. And so again, no doubt many of us are here because there is food to be cooked, people to entertain, gifts to give out, and we are trying to the best of our abilities, every one of us, to make it to as many services as we can, understanding that if things boil over or if somebody needs an extra ride or if someone's late to the airport or more food needs to be prepared or bought, there's some warriors who might not make all of them. I have faith in everyone here when we have most of the services. It's an interesting reading that we have, though, this morning on this Saturday because we're really in the throes of the four feasts of the Nativity of Christ. What does that mean? We're at the beginning of this great celebration. We're at the beginning of this feast where we confess not a God who said, I'm sorry things are tough for you all. I'm sorry for cancer and disease and sin and war and rape and mutilation and the whole mess of the world. Good luck. We serve a God that knew from the very beginning that in order to have us, he knew that we would make this the world. He knew that we would have all of this destruction and all of this pain and all of this hurt when we look at the mirror and all these frustrations and hurt when we turn on the news and look at our bank accounts and look at our neighbors. He knew all of that from the beginning. But he knew the only way that he could have us is it would have to be a world like that. Which means plan B is not Christ showing up. Plan A didn't work out, in a crude way of putting it. The Lord knows from the very beginning what's going to have to happen, what's going to have to be done from the very beginning, from the foundations of the world, is his eternally begotten son will have to take on flesh. That's plan A. That's plan A. We celebrate today Christ. Plan A. The fulfillment of a promise, the completion of creation, the perfection of all things, the head of heroes, the king of kings, the lord of lords, a baby born to us in a feeding trough come to rescue us. We are not alone. Indeed, Emmanuel, God is with us. So we're celebrating this incredible good news. What's almost impossible to believe, if I were to walk into some classrooms and tell them that they come from nothing, there is no point to anything, and that when they die, it doesn't matter. As G.K. Chesterton put it, they would stand up and give me a standing ovation. But if you walk into certain classrooms and tell them they are desperately loved by God, that they have a purpose, and that death isn't the end, but has been transformed into a new beginning, they might throw rocks at us. Nevertheless, that's our confession. This is good news. So why on a day like this do we have a reading about people knocking at the door and Christ saying to them, I don't know you. Get away from me. That seems like an ill-timed pericope from the middle of our roasts and our enjoyment and our company in town to go home and spend time dwelling on this scripture reading. What's happening there? I would like to suggest it's a way the church is trying to tell each one of us to celebrate this good news rightly. If we had all day, and I'm from the south, so don't try me, I could do that all day. We could tell the whole story of this messed up sinful existence that we've got. Not just our individual sins, but the ancestral sins that we carry. We don't believe in original sin and original guilt. That's not our tradition. But the sin that we've inherited from our parents and the sin that many of us pass down. You know, we're very hard in some traditions on Adam. But the proof that Adam might not have been so bad is that had I been put in his shoes, I would have done just as bad. Because if you look at my life, you can see all the sins I've got. But we might forget that in this whole story, the reason that we're celebrating the reason that this is good news is because we were a people who sat in darkness. I think most of us are Gentiles. We sat in darkness, not even like the Hebrew scriptures. We didn't even walk in darkness. We were just stuck. We sat in darkness. And everything we understood about success, about a good life, about great intimacy, about a great retirement plan, about purpose, about popularity, about power, we understood because we thought the first Adam was it. We looked at the sketch, we looked at the foreshadowing, and we said, well, that's it. And whatever makes that Adam happy will make me happy. Whatever fulfills that Adam 
will fulfill me. And there have been tons and thousands of years of cultures and societies that have done the best they could to make a life based on that first Adam. But joy of joys, we find out that the first Adam was just a typos. He was just a type. The real Adam, on whom we're supposed to base real success and real life and real purpose and real joy and real love and real peace, well, that's the second one, who is the true one, the true Adam, the Christ, the Christos. And it can be very easy when we've grown up in an air-conditioned house to forget just how hot it is outside. Perhaps an ill-timed statement in the middle of wintertime. But we didn't have to grow up like that. We didn't have to grow up in those civilizations where darkness ruled, where people didn't know any better. As Cyril of Alexandria says, where they would be ashamed of what their forefathers did, not because they had some evil intent, but because they didn't know any better. We didn't grow up like that. Almost every person in this church, whether you were baptized in the Orthodox Church or not, you knew, even if it was from a distant land, and the news came late in the day, by a writer who may have been an intruder or someone who annoyed us, we knew of a person called Christ. We knew of him. We heard of him. And he changed everything. He changed the meaning of success. Now it's about obedience to God. He changed the meaning of peace, which is fidelity to God. He changed the meaning of love, which is purity. The true Adam, who we're really based on, who we're really supposed to be formed and informed by, we celebrate in this next day coming into the world to rescue us. So again, Father, why the reading? Because if you read this story both in the Galatian account and in the story from uh, Luke today, the 13th chapter, Christ is telling people who grew up in the air conditioning, who grew up the chosen people of God, who fully expect that they're going to make it in, he goes, it doesn't work like that. I'll tell you why. Because for some reason, the people there have not chosen God. They've not chosen righteousness. They've not chosen the godly idea of success or the godly idea of purity, the godly idea of marriage, the godly idea of humility, the godly idea of life. Even though they grew up around it, they began to look at other civilizations and other cultures around them and even their own stomach. And they began to be tempted by the old Adam and began to be informed again by him. They began to look in the heat outside and go, maybe it's better out there, maybe I can do back and forth. But Christ is trying to say to we Christians who will celebrate on this day, the church is put here, is we can't make the same mistake. I think I gave a homily a couple weeks ago. And we were talking about Paul telling the people, you're dead already. The only life you've got is in Christ. And it's really fun is if you actually read that entire uh, account. The sense that you get from St. Paul is he's saying to the people there who now have Christ but are tempted to go back to their old way of living, tempted to be formed and informed by that success and that love and that delight, you hear Paul saying in an exasperated way, we've done this. Better looking people with more money and better plans and better projects and better civilizations and stronger and smarter have tried this. It doesn't work. We've done this. You get his exasperation. We've done this. Death. It doesn't work. And he tells them your life now is in the true Adam. You're not meant to be formed and informed by that old Adam. We celebrate this day for a lot of reasons, but one is that we have a new anthropology. Christ has defined for us now what it really is to be a human being. The mistakes of persons like Rousseau and others is that they started off with the idea that I'm a man, I'm a human being, so I bet I can understand what Christ is all about. This is a mistake. To understand the true man is to go, maybe I don't know anything. <laughs> maybe Christ finally reveals to us what a human being is, the way he comes. And that is meant to form and inform us. That's why we have to speak this day. As the saints have gone before us, we came to the Christian This is a huge celebration. And you can believe that he'll even call people out 
sign of the community that we think are holy and righteous and just. He'll call people from the hedges. He'll call the criminals. He'll call people from north and south and different religious traditions. He'll call those to fill his house. But it's a reminder to us, too, not to forget that, though, that this has to be the new way we live. How we celebrate Christ is by making him our new vision. He's the new typos. He's the new vision. He's the new life. And not to fall prey to blending it with something on the outside. Not because they you know, have evil intent or something terrible, but outside, that anthropology is still informed by the old Adam. And so it invades TikTok, Facebook, all of our news feeds, how we do business, where we struggle in our marriages, how we deal with our own ego, Everything outside on the front pages of all the magazines, God bless them, is misleading. But you get it, right? Because that's what they think life is. On well, this Sunday, we're reminded, don't fall prey to that. It doesn't work. We've done it. In closing, St. Cyril of Alexandria says, when this young man says, how few, how many people are going to make it into heaven? St. Cyril says, Jesus Christ's response is a way of saying to him, you're asking a ridiculous question. The question is, how do you get it? And we'll be really super duper theological here because the kingdom of heaven is synonymous with Jesus Christ himself. How do I experience Christ as heaven and not hell? How do I live in this banquet feast forever and experience real life and real joy and not die like the first Adam? And it seems to be that in this reading, on this day, to celebrate the same kind of life that Christ lived, to try to live that way. It seems like a point that's beat into the ground over and over again. I know I've heard it a thousand times. Sometimes the priest is quieter, sometimes he's yelling at me like a good coach might be. But regardless, the lesson is the same. Christians, when we celebrate this feast, besides being here for all the services, of course, and besides the roast that we'll have and the people that we have in town and the gifts that we'll give, Honor this feast by seeing Christ as the new Adam, which is what really forms and informs us to see this feast as the time when we stay faithful to that Christ, that we can experience the kingdom of heaven as heaven, and that we're not on the outside, in the cold, or in the heat, you know, crying out, I wanted to be a part of this. So it's a tough reading for this day. But it's also the greatest reading in the world because this is what life-saving advice sounds like. And the lifeguards are yelling at us, you know, this is the new vision. Be informed only by him and shut your ears up to everything outside that is contrary or against this Christ who's come to rescue us. Live in his love. To God be the glory.